people involved with it and to celebrate um, what God has already been at work uh, among us doing through the churches. So um, I just want to start with a little bit of my own story. This is um, my wife and I, Jen. Um, Jen is a doctor, uh, and we're, we're congregation members at um, St. Paul's Anglican Church in Simon Street in the heart of Auckland. We um, have had a long-standing concern about climate change, and in 2013, we went to hear um, Bill McKibben, who's um, an international climate activist and head of 350.org. We went to hear him speak in Auckland um, on a speaking tour, and he explained that uh, essentially the world has a carbon budget that we are able to, um, to utilize. When we exceed that budget, we have a good chance of um, tipping the world into a very serious condition of climate change. <coughs> At that, the, the, uh, we have James Renwick here with us who will explain in more detail the science of climate change and there have been some minor updates to that picture, but overall um, the picture remains the same. The vast majority of fossil fuels in particular, coal, oil and, gra and gas, need to stay in the ground. Uh, and that evening Bill McKibben said that there is something that churches can do, there's something that universities can do, there is something that um, councils can do and uh, something quite easy, which is to take your money out of fossil fuel companies. Refuse to support fossil fuel companies with your investments. That evening, my wife and I were deeply affected by this message, and we went home, we prayed about it, and we thought, we thought to ourselves, the churches in New Zealand really ought to be doing this. The churches in New Zealand um, ought to be making a moral stand against climate change and taking their money out of fossil fuel companies. So we set to work um, contacting individuals and churches throughout New Zealand uh, to see what could be done on this question. And what I discovered very quickly was a whole network of individuals and organisations throughout the country who were already activated on climate change, already organising around the issue of climate change, already deeply concerned about climate change. Uh, first and foremost, um, I discovered that there was a group in Auckland called the Diocesan Climate Change Action Group, um, associated with the Anglican Diocese of Auckland. Um, and quickly, uh, we became involved in that group. Um, and now I'm the convener of that group, and some of the members of that group are here today. Um, but it wasn't just the Climate Change Action Group, there were individuals and groups throughout the country already faithfully working on uh, the question of, of climate change. We discovered that the church leaders in New Zealand, some at least, uh, over the last few years, had taken quite a public stand on the issue of climate change um, and had publicly uh, written statements uh, acknowledging the existence of the problem, urging, uh, urging action on the problem by churches but also by governments. So I want to just very quickly um, uh, show you a couple of these uh, these individuals and these statements and some of the organisations and activities that are currently going on um, around the country among churches and faith organisations. Uh, so first of all, uh, a couple of statements. These are not the only statements and public, public statements that have been made by churches, but just a couple of highlights. Um, again, when I started researching, I discovered that the, the, the entire set of bishops and archbishops of the Anglican Church in this province of Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia had written a statement ahead um, uh, in 2006 um, on climate change. It was a very strong statement saying climate change is a real and present danger to the future of this planet and the survival of the species and we as bishops are now committed to commending a policy of carbon neutrality and for the sake of us all we call upon governments, local governments, businesses and faith communities to work together in this important area to contain and reduce climate change. That's leadership. Ahead of the Copenhagen climate talks in 2009, remarkably, church leaders from six different denominations in this country came together to sign us a public statement urging action on climate change. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, a, a landmark statement in the history of churches in New Zealand. 
2009, had said, among other things, as church leaders, we have spoken out for several years in our different congregations on the significant impact of climate change, particularly on the most poor and vulnerable members of our global communities. Since 2007, information from the scientific community has become ever more pressing and urgent. Scientists warn us that the window of opportunity for change is now very narrow. They warn us that if we do not grasp this opportunity, future, gen future generations will be the ones to bear the costs. Uh, and just in the last few months, uh, the Anglican bishops again issued a statement ahead of the Paris climate negotiations in November last year. So there's a history of church leaders in this country standing up, and we need more of this. I just wanted to honour a few people that I've come across in my journey um, who have been involved in uh, the climate issue from a faith perspective in New Zealand. Um, there are many others in this room who have been active uh, who are not represented here, but this, in a sense, is just um, a representation of individuals throughout faith communities in this country who have been working hard and praying hard on the issue of climate change. Um, and they include uh, Reverend Elder um, Suamali Yosefa uh, Naisali, who is here with us today and will be praying for us later. He's a leader of the Tuvaluan community in New Zealand. He's a, a minister of the United Reformed Church of Tuvalu in New Zealand. Um, and for many years, he's been a vocal, uh, a, a vocal uh, advocate for climate justice, particularly for the low-lying Pacific Islands. Uh, Betsan Martin, the co-organizer of this um, today's event, also has been uh, very concerned and active on climate change for many years, and it's been a privilege to get to know her over the last few years. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Jonathan Boston, um, who is a man of faith, and has um, worked tirelessly um, in an extraordinary capacity, supporting churches, but also working on public policy um, around the issue of climate change, among many other social justice issues. Um, and he's been an inspiration to me, and I know is to many of us here. Um, Dr. Murray Sheard, who's also with us this morning, uh, is another inspiring individual who I've come in contact with over the last uh, few years. Uh, Murray works with Arosha, um, whose work I'll, I'll talk about briefly later, as well as Tear Fund New Zealand, um, and is an advocate on climate change. Last year, um, Murray, uh, with a group of other organisations, invited leaders from Pacific churches to come to New Zealand to speak from a Pacific perspective on the impacts of climate change, and that was an excellent initiative. Uh, Jenny Campbell, um, from Anglican Social Justice Network, um, who is also here with us today. Um, I want to honour her and her um, commitment. Uh, she is also involved in the Coal Action Network and is not afraid to get, um, to get her hands dirty on, um, on issues like this. And so uh, this is a wonderful example. And Robert Howell, who, I, I, um, who is also here with us this morning, um, is a Quaker and um, a leader in this space and has been for for um, many years, particularly on the investment, ethical investment side of the equation. So, um, some, some inspiring statements, some inspiring individuals, and of course there are many more here in the room today who aren't up on the screens, um, and of course others around the country uh, who um, have been faithful in this respect. We're hoping that today will catalyze new interest and will inspire a new generation of people to get involved in the issue of climate justice. Um, and can continue this work. I also just wanted to mention a couple of um, initiatives and programs that are already underway. Um, the Quakers have, a, have developed over a number of years some excellent resources and um, uh, studies on the issue of climate change, uh, and these are particularly relevant to a church, church audience. Caritas, the social justice arm of the Catholic Church in New Zealand, have for the last couple of years put a great deal of resource into writing well-researched reports on the state of the environment in the Pacific region with a particular focus on Pacific Islands. Um, and their second report came out last year, um, Caring for Our Common Home. Um, so they're um, continuing to provide resources for the churches as well as for public policy. The group that I'm involved with, the Climate Change Action Group in the Auckland Diocese has a website called Cherished Earth. Um, this website contains a lot of resources um, around sustainability for parishes. 
energy, heating, lighting for buildings, uh, but also some information about climate change uh, and some resources for um, taking action in churches. And we'll hear again later on today, we'll hear about what the group is up to at the moment um, in establishing community gardens, communal food gardens in parishes in Auckland. And then finally, Arosha, which is a conservation focused um, Christian organization that um, uh, people around the country, people of faith around the country are participants in, um, is doing excellent work. So finally, let me just go back to the divestment story briefly. Um, as I said, uh, my wife and I began to connect with people and uh, through the activity of a vast network of people across the country, um, uh, we, we managed to organize uh, divestment motions to come to general assemblies and synods. Uh, already in 2013, five Anglican synods had voted to divest from fossil fuels. Early the following year, with a strong push from the Polynesian arm of uh, the Anglican Church in, the, in this region, uh, the Anglican Church of this province became the first Anglican church body in the world to um, reject fossil fuel investments. The Quakers have also um, embraced fossil fuel divestment, in some ways going further, requiring that um, they divest even from banks who invest in fossil fuels. And last but not least, the Presbyterian Church had, at its General Assembly um, the year before last now also um, resolve to, to um, disinvest from fossil fuel companies. So it's been quite a strong movement in New Zealand and we're hoping to continue the momentum on fossil fuel divestment among many other initiatives that we as churches can take leadership on. So um, that's enough for me, that's, that's the entree, that's the background. The question now is, what's the next chapter for church leadership on climate change in this country? Thank you very much.